Vancouver, actually. Um, has, been, has become one of the, the highlights, I think, for me uh, when I think about this, about this conference. And um, what it is, is it's an opportunity for us to uh, invite two leaders in our field uh, to get together and talk a bit about their work to each other and find out more about each other and, and ask each other questions here with all of us. And so um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Anne Catania, Lincoln Center Theater's dramaturg and director of the Lincoln Center Director's Lab. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. 
completely handy in my job. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I feel like the, uh, the role of the dramaturg in my, in my time of, of watching it unfold has really, um, uh, uh, you know, begun to shift, you know, in ways, um, and that there's a, a kind of balance, it seems like to me, between the work in the room and the work outside the room with the audience and the conversation. And I just wonder how you see that unfolding um, in terms of that. But where is the emphasis now um, in, in, your, in your work around surgery? Well, I, I, have, I don't know whether it's you know, my first job. I think, I think like they say, you always love the songs you loved in high school, and you always have the same haircut you had in high school. And, you know, you, kind of, you are formed in some regards by your first experiences of whatever they were. Um, and my first job in the theater was I was uh, the assistant to Ed Hastings, who was the associate artistic director of ACT in San Francisco under the great Bill Wall during the days of the, the best days of ACT, um, which was a high art theater which stood on the shoulders of theaters before it, like the ACA back in Europe, you know, very conscious, very, uh, on its path, very high art. And I too am very conscious of the shoulders that I am standing on. And, and the director's on, I really focus a lot on, you know, in theater is an apprentice craft. It's like bird Um you, you learn, you used to learn by watching other people, you know, you'd be standing in the wings holding a spear, and you watch them have another actor to do this, and if you need to bear your arm in rehearsal, you go back and see how other actors did it. Did something in the 18th century, there's just lots of information, practical. One of the things that I love the most about the theater um, is, that, is that we are a microcosm of, of our society. Um, I had a magazine, that's on theater review, John Boyer, and we asked the head of Teachers College to do a piece for us piece for us once about it. It was actually about race. And he said the only two places in colleges that are not really segregated, you know, different, you know people eat at different tables and you know, all those Sports and theater, and that's true socially as well. I mean, I I work and and, and I I know how to sew a little. Well. You know, there are people backstage who've never been involved. There are seamstresses, there's dressers, there's actors, there's directors, there's ushers. I mean, we are a whole microcosm of the world in a social way that I think is a, that is unusual. And not only do we say hello to each other, we we have to work together. We we like to.
agencies will be closed, and um, the USIA, which is now you know merged into state about seven years ago, or something, it's been it's been literally zeroed out financially, and our presence, our the artists, have vanished. There used to be senators who supported us who go above the hill.
on the couch while the shows are playing, or going to put things in the microwave, you know, I mean, they're big, it's on, but what's their engagement with it? Whereas in theater, when you're playing as an actor, you really, you know when it's engaging or when it's not engaging. So it's, it's really apples and oranges in, in some respects. And um, I had a, a friend who had my job at the Comedy Francaise, which gets 99% of the stage sort of budget size, it's one of the uh, theater, it gets 99% of its operating budget in a single check from the French government on January 1st. It's less than one tenth of one percent of its budget, all state, federal, city sources combined. So it's like apples and oranges, you know, in terms of money. And I, he was in town, and um, this is quite a while ago. We were in suburbia by the way, I think it was the fires of the mirror. And he, he, he was completely flabbergasted. He said, My God, you know, you know, you have a civil disturbance, and 18 months later, you have this fantastic play, an unbelievable production on Broadway, it's full. You know, we even have the Algerian War, and no one's ever written a play about it. That was 
models in theater has changed substantially. I mean, I think we're, I think we're all asking ourselves um, um, about, um, you know, how we ensure um, the relevance of our art form. Um, and I think that's true of really any art form. I mean, how does it matter? Why is it relevant? Um, and I think particularly when it comes to um, the requirement of asking people to come together, um, oftentimes to leave their, the comfort of their um, favorite uh, HBO series um, and, um, and, and, and come together in the community um, for a shared experience. I think um, that that's not a given that, that people, you know, that they necessarily want to do it. It's also not a given that they're going to make the theater their destination. Uh, I think we all are in a conversation about, um, you know, um, uh, audiences uh, getting older and not being replaced with um, another generation. And, uh, um, and, and I think we're all thinking about how we're in a dialogue about the relevance of our art form. And so I feel like that challenge has awakened us as a community in a way that I feel really excited about. Um, I feel like uh, there are conversations uh, and, and, and activities happening in every single part of this country that is directly around the question of civic engagement and how the theater creates conversation and invites an audience, not just to sit in a talk back, which is one way to do it, but actually to lead that conversation. And, uh, and in fact, you know, it, 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 here in, in, in Boston, in my work, uh, in my Arts Emerson work, which is our pre presenting producing farm, um, I just, uh, this weekend I'm in a conversation and just left that conversation of um, uh, creating a whole uh, neighborhood um, group that is tasked with leading the dialogue um, around our, you know, a number of our shows next season um, and that they're um, telling us how that will happen versus us telling them. And I think there's something about um, the curatorial role in conversation is changing and I feel like the dramaturgical world is really critical in being a part of that exchange. And so for me, uh, I feel um, uh, alive and excited about the field and that possibility in a way that um, uh, makes me feel like our work is just starting. I mean, I feel, you know, I'm 18 years into the business or something, and 18 years in, I'm like, oh, I see, um, I, I see the future in a way that I hadn't maybe seen it five or 10 years ago. So that's really exciting. Basic elements of the comedy of job. I mean, our, our job is to is to is to nurture um, and bring into the producing theaters of small and large artists, playwrights, directors, directors, actors, but primarily playwrights. And it's those playwrights who will be doing, who will be speaking in this way. So, so it, it's not only
there's a, a hole in our in our leadership in our in our community, and I feel like it's a hole that the um, the, the Ghana surgical community is sort of right to fill. Um, I feel like there's been a way in which um, uh, that question of like um, you know that question of parity, that question of inclusivity, I feel like the the have the been leading that conversation with their audience, with their community, with their theater for a really long time. And I, I was so heartened by, um, you guys have talked about this all weekend, and uh, you know, I'm late to the game, but I was so heartened by the intervention of the Kilroys, which is an intervention that comes right out of the relationship between dramaturgs and playwrights. Um, and, that, that, and, and what that intervention meant, and you know, it, 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 we, there's a lot of talk about its upside and its downside. I see most of the upside in the intervention, and, and because it, it took a hole, and there was a, an ability for a group of playwrights and dramaturgs to provide leadership, that the field has changed in such a way, um, and that the opportunity to have impact has changed so significantly, particularly with you know, the ease that technology makes that happen, that suddenly people can jump into leadership um, and have a voice, and that single intervention, which to my mind, as, as, I, as I interviewed the group last week, I mean, it cost under $200, it was an under $200 intervention, is changing the conversation we're having about play single-handedly. Now, to me, that all I think about with that intervention is there has to be a hundred more like that that we could do between now and next LMDA conference that could change the, the conversation another, you know, because we have such a long, long way to go. Um, that it's even a thing we needed, that we needed an intervention of a list of female you know, playwrights in 2014 is something we personally cannot get over, um, but we did, so there you have it. And so that means we have a, such a long way to go, and I feel like, I, I, to me, and again, my work is, you know, particularly my work is successful, but now my work here, that, that work is happening very particularly and being led by a number of you in this room. I follow you on Twitter, I follow you on Facebook, I'm, uh, you're writing for HowlRound, um, you're leading that conversation. And I feel like, you know, I've always wondered why um, there hasn't been more room for um, dramaturgs to be in top leadership positions in this country, um, because I feel like facilitating dialogue is really going to be the most important um, skill set for, you know, what is, you know, 2014 and beyond. Uh, I feel like that's actually figuring out how to take the chaos and make meaning of it. Um, and I feel like in a weird way that's what the Kilroys did. They just took a bunch of chaos and they made some meaning. And it might not be the meaning that you agree with, it might not be the people that are on your list, but then they said, but, but they, they really opened the door for um, others to make other kinds of meaning. And I feel like that's kind of our challenge, um, is to take that space, grab it, run with it. Um, and, uh, and, that, and the list got me, you know, that intervention got me excited in that kind of way. Amen, I can say only because, because I think I think your point is very profound. Um, yes, I mean, you know, as times change or leaders change, I was talking to somebody who was who was um, justifiably complaining about the fact that in England, you know, leaders of theaters are switched out every five years. Uh, and in this country, leaders of theaters stay on for decades and decades. And there's a very simple reason for that, and it's money. Um, and the person we were talking to said, you know, if, if, if we gave you this job, I think we're talking to colleagues and you took that job, will you have the same relationship with the people who are giving you the four million here and the six million here on your board, or would they just walk away from you? I mean, the cultivation that artistic directors have to do to keep, to keep the buildings open is almost 70% of their job at this point. Um, in England, they don't have that. They don't have to do any of that. Uh, it's all still, for, even though it's less, and it's still provided by the government. But I think what that does is that it, is that it allows other people to to come up with fabulously interesting ideas uh, in England, like the Shed um, at the National, or um, I can't remember what theater just changed. Vicky Featherstone runs what? Okay, so Royal Court, and she was asked to program their first season, and she decided, you know, correctly, all of the bad ideas from the announcers are doing because you'll immediately be attacked. So she 
crazy if I'm wrong, she just turned the theater over for six months to 40, 40 playwrights. And they, of course, filled. And I think they even sold tickets without even announcing what they were doing. So you would buy a ticket to Monday night, Sunday evening, go see something. There would be something there. <laughs> <laughs> a, whole, a whole different way, of, or you know, you could be buying this ticket to this play, but just, you'd just be going to buy into the new work of this. Um, I, I'm thinking also politically about what I said before, of reaching out to people in the community and uh, you know, bringing them to the theater and opening dialogue. other 
white-haired gay man. And I thought, this is why they hate us. This is what they think New York theater is. That's the best who was there? No, it was there and it wasn't people. there. Yeah, yeah. Right? But if, but if any of those people in Washington had walked in, it would completely affirm what they think we're doing, right? It's, you know, highbrow theater for gay people. Um, and, uh, and I had to wonder, what was Lincoln Center Theater thinking? That that, was that its first cinema broadcast? Um, just to make, no. I think South the cinema was the first. I mean, this whole cinema thing is new because yeah. of the, the union situation has just been changed to allow a broadcast. No, South the cinema was broadcast. I saw that on television, not in the theater. Yeah. yeah. made a comment, a public comment about um, 
the, about us being, a, the, about the arts being a bunch of rich people that go to a bunch of galas, uh, to, which I really resonated with me when you were talking about that, Anne, because I was like, well, yeah, we heard that up north a little while ago. So not true. No. So we, we, we don't have a dissimilar <coughs> issue. We have, a, we have a different, maybe a different funding uh, structure and that kind of thing, a much different funding structure, uh, but, but our need to constantly be advocating for the, the larger impact that we have or can have, I think it's, it's very present. And I don't know if anyone else from Canada wants to speak to that or say amen or whatever they want to do, but. Same in the UK. And in the UK? Yeah. Is it, do you want to, do you want to stand up and just speak to that a little or just oh. say hi? Hi from hi. the UK. Okay, hey. <laughs> I'm from Belfast, one from here, but I work there. And it's, it's very similar. It's, um, it's very, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of public funding, but I say a lot, it's like the smallest part of the budget. You could quintuple this budget, and in like, you know, count, terms of pounds, no one would notice that amount. They would be like, oh, that's teeny tiny. But what they do instead is they recently, about four years ago, they cut about 24% of the arts budget, and now they're about to cut it again by 12%, which is making sweet FA difference to any of the fiscal situation, but it is decimating the, the artistic um, availability pump for that. Germany and Italy, too. Italy as well? And Germany, yeah. And Germany, okay. It's rough all over. I, I just want to add to that. Yeah. I, I think the question of, of um, the, the privilege of the arts and the sense that the arts are for the few is a, is a problem to a degree um, that we brought upon ourselves. Um, and I think we, I, I think we're at a point, I, I would say we have to, I think we are owning it. I feel like that is what the conversation is beginning to be about. If you think, and I, I'm going to speak very specifically about my expertise, which is the American context, so if others can speak of uh, the international context, but in the American context, we have created a theater based on exclusivity. Uh, we've created a theater based on subscription models, the specific benefits for membership. Um, we've created an insider's club. Um, that <coughs> club has been, in a sense, one that, uh, you know, I'm sure for multiple reasons, I don't want to, uh, you know, be the expert on exactly why that club has looked a particular way. Um, it's been from a particular socioeconomic class. Um, and I, I think we have to, to own the reality of that. I think it wasn't, um, it wasn't made in, with bad intentions. In fact, I think it was made with many good intentions. But it, but it, drew, um, a, it drew a class and it, and, it, and, it, and it created a sense of exclusion. And we are now, I think, in a period of reality around that where we, we are doing things and are responsible for addressing that history. Um, and I think, you know, I think one can argue that in a strange way that, that you know, it's, it's always hard to pinpoint when a thing like that happens. I don't think the regional theater started with those intentions in mind, and, and, I, and I think, in fact, it started as a countercultural movement, but at some point it, it was not countercultural. A lot of people like to point to that, that moment being the 1980s and, and, and Reaganomics, and if you read, um, you know, Michael Sandel's book about, you know, um, uh, what money can't buy, um, he will also pinpoint that period where we began to make everything, we commercialized everything, we put a price tag on everything. Now, whether that's you know true or not, I think we're all dealing with, in our theaters, the reality of that notion of exclusivity. And again, I don't think there was ever good intentions in that, but I think we're now at a point where um, uh, we have to be very intentional about this question of inclusivity. And the reason we've been dismissed very much as an art form has to do with that sense that we are serving the few and not the many, and funders want to be serving the many. Yeah, but you see, I, I, I totally disagree. I mean, I think that's the irony, and that's what's so disturbing, is that, that there's that $3.7 trillion figure, is that, and all of you who work in theaters know that all of us are doing outreach in every possible way we can to young audiences, to worship people, to young people, as best we can, in our education programs, Nobody's sitting in their theaters thinking, oh, we just want rich people to come to our theater. Maybe we want rich people to sit on our board of directors, but <laughs> no one who's working in any theater that I know of thinks like this. And I think I think that's the irony is that at a time when there are, I mean, I actually have a little napkin that I wrote this thing on because I couldn't believe it. I mean, I think there are 1,700 theaters in this country with an operating budget of $75,000 or more. So it's small enough. I mean, we're everywhere. We're in every part of the country. And yet somehow we are perceived as this one thing. And I'm, I suspect thinking about this 
you know, going into slab of audiences, that it also is tied into arts education. I mean, the, the truest thing I heard in the last year was somebody on a panel said, if there had been arts education in Colorado, there would have been no column line. Because those kids would have immediately taken a photography class that could learn about, you know, don't squawk me all, or Bloody Burrows, or Tom and Egg, or totally at all, and not need to go to the basement and watch TV and go out and shoot somebody. They realize they're just like everybody else as an artist, you know, but they were totally isolated because they knew nothing about art. So I, I think it boils down to cutting those budgets. I mean, but I don't think we are totally elite. I think we are all working and, and successfully working, and yet the perception is jarring. Uh, yeah, I see. I see. There's been there's lots of hands. So there was Jules and Jane and Liz and Liana and Salisa and Heidi. So we're going to start with Jules. Oh, I, 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 I think I was just going to say because I've been recently hearing about the term impact, right? And so uh, thinking about counting the new beans and the notion of an impact as being something to try and connect. Uh, what we're doing as a community and touching communities and all this kind of outreach, but also then hearing from folks in the UK that impact is now something that's being used to evaluate and gather funding. And so that impact is something that is uh, sort of granting and larger bodies that have, I think, a much more operational term of uh, understanding of that as opposed to transformational. Using that again to sort of say, well, you're not impactful enough and therefore, impact is not drawn out of a community, it's not in a conversation, it becomes a commodity <coughs> that then is sort of fed back into evaluation systems that I think really need dramaturgical <coughs> intervention. Not that I want to learn another text to read in some sense, but I think if we also leave our studies, our surveys, our evaluations to other people and we're not actively constructing those questions about what are we measuring, how are we measuring, and what those measurements mean, then we are we allow, as you said before, Anne, right, that conversation being defined for us instead of us defining it. Um, and that seems like an active, it's one thing that we see people who are now curating sort of season announcements at the gender parity level and collecting statistics and starting to see what the narratives are, what are the numbers, what is the data, and making those public and have part of a public conversation to tie back into how is the work being done, who's funding it, who's coming to see it, as all part of one big conversation and oftentimes led by dramaturgs or people who are not in the artistic echelon but are at the work level, right? And really wanting to see how they can intervene at that particular, which is a point of leadership that might not be at the top, but it's certainly at a kind of critical level. Jane? Well, hi. Um, I, I just think that part of what I'm a little frustrated with in terms of why, what we're talking about with regards to sort of the future of dramaturgy is that we keep going back to the notion of theaters, physical theaters, mm -hmm. and I don't see that as the future. <laughs> Some you know 
existing power person choosing somebody, it's always been created, in other words, by, it's never been created by a young person penetrating an existing organization. It's always been created by people, usually young, who see the world in a similar way. They're friends. One of them's a director, one of them's a creative playwright, one of them's a writer, some of them's a designer, maybe it's kind of like far like it is at the Moscow Art Theater. You know, you all saw Shakespeare in Love, you know, that scene. There's some kind of scene, the seven little people went to college together, and they start to make theater together. And the new group, uh, the group theater, you know, the SF actor group. And they come in um, and start presenting, usually in a small venue, and if they're good, they can come out of that. So, so I see now, um, you know, now to, to what you were just saying, young people coming out of school who are speaking in a way to their peers with material created by their friends that is attractive to their peers. Um, and, and frankly, whether it happens in a big building or not, the reason that the building, big buildings were there was because a lot of people wanted to see the work, so they, had, they built big buildings to accommodate them. Um, but, but the more important question is, is what is the work? I mean, and, and I, say to the directors of here, who are your roommates? You know, because everyone's sharing apartments with over with five people, you know. <laughs> do, do they go to the theater? I mean, what are they, what are they doing with themselves? Why are they not? I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, that's where we are, it seems to be right now. It's not so much subscription versus membership. That's a debate from 20 years ago. It's, it's singing a song that people want to sing. You know, uh, to kind of uh, to follow up on that, and maybe to just disagree a little to keep the conversation energized. Um, uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I feel like what is the work is only one question now, among other questions, and I think that's a change. And so I think the work matters tremendously. Uh, I think excellence in the work is always going to be a key part of what we do. Um, but I think uh, why. The question of why the work is a question of now, uh, and I think we're being asked that question in a way, and I think we are being asked to justify our relevance, and I, I actually feel comfortable with that question. And I think that this, this issue of, um, I think that now is civic dialogue and civic engagement, and it's about a theater of, of we, um, and um, a, a theater of our communities. You know, I, I, again, I, I'm sitting, I just am coming, going back and forth today between this other room of, of, of you know, a sort of civic activists in Boston, you know, who have felt outside of the conversation of the theater for the entire time that theater has been in Boston. Now, that's not a whole, that, I don't mean that in every way, shape, and form, but there's a divide in this city that I can speak very specifically to of who has felt invited to the theater and who has felt uninvited to the theater. And, and, and I feel like that, and I think there's a lot being done to address it, so don't, I don't, and I don't think Art Emerson is the only one, there's a lot of really cool things um, that I know that you talk about, what the Huntington's doing, some great things happening there, Company One, I know that I've seen it tweeted out several times this week. So there's a lot of work being done. I think that's our work of now. Our work of now is that civic dialogue, um, and that the work and the dialogue have to live side by side. Um, so I guess that's how I see the now. Liana, and then Salisa and Heidi. is really interesting and in that we're not talking about aesthetics, particularly populist aesthetic. Um, so what I say every time I'm in front of the Woodruff Art Center Board, which is not a theater board, but is the Art Center Board, is I, I don't even say what I do. I start out and I say, who watches Parenthood? Who watches Parenthood in this room? Okay. Who I ever watched Glee? Who's watched Glee? Who watched House of Cards? People from the playwriting program that the Alliance Theater runs called the Candida National Playwriting competition, write for all these shows, 
they were discovered because of our competition. That's why we're important and seen. <laughs> and um, that's all I have to say. Um, you know, I also think the American theater has allowed Frozen to just get on a train and pass us by. Okay, who wrote Frozen? Okay, I mean, I'll have to figure out how to do that from coming from Georgia, but I, I do think that there is a populist train filled with theater artists that the theaters have trained and nurtured and watered and loved who are amazing, and they're writing these amazing texts that have, are defining our generation. Like, I don't think if you have a kid under 10, you know, it, Frozen is only definitive if you have a kid under 10, but if you do have a kid under 10, like, there, there are, or maybe not, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I do think they're, they're, the populist art forms in America right now are in a golden age, they're an incredible age. And most of that technique is coming out of theater, but I think that we, as a, as a larger theater community, are sometimes allowing that wonderful, wonderful art to, to pass us by without credit. Um, and, and, uh, and now is a great time to own the work and own that you can't create some of these beautiful populist uh, uh, texts, if you will, without real skill and rigor and ability to listen and ability to understand the audience. And that's coming out of our community, but we're just letting it come out of the community and waving goodbye. Heidi? Um, I guess I, I'd just like to ask a question about uh, whether this question that the political elites think that theatrical elites don't deserve funding because they're elite, or whether uh, there is actually a, a recognition that theater is about public discourse, mm -hmm. and that actually I feel, in Canada at least, that uh, Stephen Harper is very aware of how the arts stimulate public discourse and is intentionally squashing public discourse in an extremely dangerous way. And I feel that there's a question uh, because we have a lot of uh, impact at the civic level, and we have a lot of interesting conversations at the civic level and make a lot of progress at that level. Uh, what do you feel the responsibility is to acknowledge that actually, you know, there's, there's Princeton studies about the fact that the United States is no longer a democracy. I feel it's a similar analysis in Canada. Our, our voting uh, participation levels are at record lows. And so if the theater is a, a process that teaches us how to collaborate, that teaches us how to make decisions collectively. What is our responsibility as theater artists to acknowledge the political situation that we're really in, that lobbying actually may not be uh, a very useful tactic when the uh, powers that be, at least in my country, are completely aware of the power of theater and are completely committed to silencing it? First of all, none of us have the money to lobby, so forget that word. But, but, but you know, I mean, so your point is so well taken. I think the answer to the question is that is that all, all of us come from different parts of the country or from Canada, and, and we have, you know, there are public figures who are our mayors or our representatives in our cities or our representatives in, in Congress or, you know, they're just people. Have they ever been to your theater? Do you know them? Have you have you ever you know, do you have any connection with them? So, so would you say that very eloquent thing that you just said? 
Raven's Come to Dawn. That was a pretty scary night. A black raven at a play just after he was elected. Can you just hear what happened to the theater? <laughs> 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 Many first ladies had come to theaters. But the Kennedy said, you know, what, why that was great. And he just, just to be in, in the dialogue, you know, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, the Norman remembers this, you know, a lot of people lost elections because of the last thing he was. Because the,
question. Um, do you uh, both, either do you think that the regional theater movement in the United States and Canada has run its course? And if so, what as, personally as a dramaturg, do you think you would like to see Grove replace it? <laughs> Money, no, the administration, no, the other 
uh, things on the spaces and so on. And this is the, uh, the fact that theater reaches stagnation the moment when it stops asking itself, why do, does this art form exist at all? Because when it becomes self-evident, when it becomes something routinized, then it has no justification to, it, to exist uh, in, a, in, a, in a world which is covered by so many uh, forms of, of media and so on. Especially, and if, if you look at all the uh, the, the points in, uh, in in history where where, where the theater uh, was invigorated, where we saw again, it was when people asked themselves, for instance, in the group theater in, 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 in America or or. Uh, drama in Germany and so on, when theater people ask themselves, why the hell do we do this? Who needs this anymore? And that's why young people don't go to the theater. Because they don't, they don't see the justification of the existence of this archaic, old-fashioned, stagnated form of art. Uh, certainly proud of uh, the work that we do uh, in uh, 
uh, Art Theater in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and with uh, our uh, student body. I would say that uh, the most theatrically rich work that I've been involved with in the past year has been the Moral Monday movement in North Carolina, where I got myself arrested last July. Uh, and, uh, it's because uh, that uh, is a movement that has come out of an absolute need. And I think that goes back to uh, what Gad was saying and uh, a number of the topics that uh, have uh, been brought up in today's conversation. Um, I feel a little uh, shy speaking up because I feel like I'm one of the young people in the room. Um, but speaking, <laughs> speaking for myself as a young person and as a theater maker and who knows a lot of young people who aren't in theater, um, in terms of the outreach, like outreach is great, but when I go to the theater, often what I'm looking for is an experience. That's what I'm looking for when I go to the movies. That's what I'm looking for when I go to a concert. And I feel like very often, if I go to the theater, at, for example, like where I'm based in Toronto, if I go to the theater like Canadian Stage, one of the large regionals, I often don't feel like I've had an experience. I kind of leave the theater at 9.30 or 10 o'clock and think, so like, I go home now? Um, and I just want to put that out there, because we haven't talked a great deal about aesthetic, and I think that's actually a good thing for a conversation like this, to leave that out of it. But as someone who wants to go and have a really awesome time at the theater and leave feeling totally energized, I feel I don't often have that experience. And so I just wanted to put that out to everyone.
Center, and thank you to HowlRound TV for making this conversation accessible to people outside of this room as well. And most especially, I'd like to thank Anne Catano and Polly Carl for inspiring. <laughs>